Hello, welcome to Dirt Rich, seasonal conversations about food and farming. I'm Jared Lumen, the Soil Health Lead for the Sustainable Farming Association. And today I'm back again with Tyler Carlson talking a little bit more about silvopasture. Today we're hoping to cover a little more in depth on what farmers can do on their farms to implement silvopasture on their farms and then also get a little bit into his farm and what he's doing. So with that, I guess we'll get started. Thanks so much, Tyler, yeah, for, sure. for joining me. I know we talked a lot about uh, silvopasture in the last episode, and the best way for people to get a little bit more knowledge on it would be to go back and listen to the last episode that we talked about uh, silvopasture on. But why don't you just give us a brief overview of silvopasture and some of the benefits that it can offer to farmers? Sure, yeah. So the definition of silvopasture, again, is it's, it's the intentional integration and management of trees, forage, and livestock into one farming system, one agricultural system. And um, so you're intensively managing the tree component to provide um, sort of optimal growing conditions for the forage below, whether that's, you know, primarily we're talking grasses and forbs, think, you know, about pasture. Um, sometimes that can include brush though, particularly if you're grazing goats. And um, in addition, you're intensively managing the livestock and um, their impacts and uh, where they are on the land and at what times. And um, the benefits from that system, you know, we, we see a, a lot of benefits, you know, from the environmental and, um, you know, soil health, water quality, wildlife, carbon sequestration is um, potentially uh, huge with these systems, particularly when we're planting trees. But in the long run, I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of potential for carbon sequestration with silvopasture pasture generally. And um, in addition for the producer, we're looking at, you know, economic returns. We're looking at economic benefits to the producer from, you know, increasing the value of timber by managing those stands of trees, possibly even planting higher value, you know, species of trees. And then we're looking at improved animal performance during the growing season, particularly, you know, during you know, hot weather events, um, you know, so, so depending on the year, if it's, if it's really hot in July and August, it got hot pretty early this year in, in Minnesota. And um, we really benefited a lot from having some silver pasture around instead of just open pasture. Um, and so, you know, by, by providing optimal growing conditions for the forage, as well as, you know, comfortable conditions for the livestock, they can continue to graze and they can be comfortable while doing so. And that's going to, that's going to lead to better returns for, for the, for the livestock farmer. So you, you just mentioned there that, you know, that got hot this summer and you were grateful and benefited from your civil pasture. Why don't you just tell us a little bit about your farm in specific, I guess. What do you do uh, on your farm? What are you raising and how are you implementing civil pasture? Sure. So um, I have a degree in horticultural science from the University of Minnesota while I was there. Um, I studied agroforestry and civil pasture intensively. Um, absolutely fell in love with agroforestry at the university. And um, in 2010, when I graduated, I decided I was gonna start a farm and actually put to work and try to test out some of the things that I was learning about. And um, I have 200 acres of land in Todd County that uh, my wife and I farm. We've been there since 2012, raising grass-fed beef and pastured lamb for the last uh, four years. And we have some perennial fruit, but it's kind of a side project. We're doing some experimentation with uh, some different shrub fruits. But um, so we market direct to Minnesota, primarily Minnesota consumers, um, both retail and, uh, you know, wholesale, you know, quarter, half full kind of thing, um, about 30 to 40 head a year and another about uh, 25 head of lamb at this point. And um, so when we first started in 2012, we had 60 acres that you might consider tillable ground. I um, probably wouldn't till all of it, yeah. um, but some people might call it that much tillable. Okay. And so we planted um, 20 of that acres um, into, uh, you know, it's open ground that we, we, we planted trees into. So a different sort of establishing silver pasture, which is planting trees out into, into open fields or open pasture. And we did about six and a half acres of white pine, six and a half acres of red oak, and six and a half acres of, um, or excuse me, six and a half acres of bur oak and six and a half acres of red pine. And uh, so two pine and one oak species. And uh, we just wanted to experiment with some different things. We planted, we chose those trees primarily because a lot of research has been done on pine 
silvopasture pasture and um, we wanted some trees that we knew people and other farmers, you know, were used to planting plantation style. Mm -hmm. um, so we're just doing kind of a modified plantation style there. And so we've got those 20 acres. Um, those trees are getting pretty big now. We've got some 10 to 12, 13 foot white pine. They're getting big fast. Um, and then um, the, the, red, the red pine are doing pretty good. They're probably 10 feet tall at the most. Uh, having some issues, pocket gophers taking out quite a few trees, but uh, we overplanted what we needed in the end. So we're doing okay there. Mm. And then the red oak did not do well. The red oak or bur oak did not do well um, due to rodent pressure the first year. So, um, and those each of those are separate, kind of they're not yeah. multiple species. Yep, they're, they're separated. Separate There's six and a half acres each okay. in more of a yeah mono mono yeah type. So sure. yeah, so and they're um, they're in double rows, um, eight feet apart. So the rows are eight feet apart, mm -hmm. and then the trees are eight to ten feet apart within the row, and then there's a fifty foot gap of open pasture before the next double row of trees okay. and they're oriented north to south okay. and um, so I've been just grazing those gaps so I put fences around all those trees and I've been grazing the gaps since okay. 2012. Okay. Yeah. So that's when what we started with. Um, I was primarily interested in, in introducing more trees. I was actually interested really interested in, in sort of oak savanna restoration with some of our land, but um, mm -hmm. I knew that oak trees, you know, planting oak trees to get to oak savanna restoration would be a very long-term thing. But we, you know, we did plant six and a half acres to oaks and, you know, it just, it failed and we haven't, you know, figured out what we're gonna do to try that again. Mm -hmm. um, planting hardwoods into pasture is challenging uh, sure. from all the um, tree planters I've spoken with. There's a lot of mammals that want to eat hardwoods. Okay. There's a lot of mammals that want to eat softwoods too, but we have a little bit easier time. Sure. So, um, and oaks are just, they're so slow going, slow yeah. growing, you know, that it takes a long time for them to get, you know, established and resilient enough to handle a lot of herbivory. Yeah. And so that's where we started. And then um, I was really curious. We had another, we have about 40 acres of, you know, what is, oak forest or or maybe was oak savanna at times there you know the, the oaks that are there are you know there's some 200 plus year old oak trees that are very large open grown oaks that are now being kind of overtopped by other trees so there's some suggestion that maybe this was a little bit more of an oak savanna kind of uh you know environment when these trees were you know 100 years ago or whatever mm -hmm. when these trees were really you know middle aged sort sure. of and so um I was curious about slowly trying to experiment with doing some silvopasture pasture on those sites and re rejuvenating the, the savanna or something close to a savanna. Sure. And so I started just um, doing some strip grazing. So 12 hour moves through my wooded pastures. We cut down the buckthorn first. There wasn't a lot, but we had mm -hmm. some. So I decided to go out and control that. And I noticed pretty quickly that, um, you know, I was able to maintain really what is almost a woodland component of species with frequent moves, just like we were doing out in our open pastures. And that, you know, almost immediately I felt like, you know, there's a, there's a trope about keeping livestock out of the woods. It's been a story we've been trying to tell farmers for a very long time and for good reason, because management hasn't been what it needed to be. Mm -hmm. But we have the capacity now to limit and really target the impact of livestock. And even without doing all of the treatments for silvopasture to create you know, a much more resilient grazing type landscape, um, I found that these plants are pretty well adapted to grazing, to a certain amount of grazing, and then as long as they're being rested. And that, and, then, and also just from seeing how trees responded you know, it was quickly apparent that like, yeah, you know, while, while we think about livestock not being in the woods, you know, the wild animals used to go in the woods too. There was nothing, there were no fences keeping the wild animals out of the woods, you know, hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago. And we had much larger animals around. Mm -hmm. uh, we had mastodons and mammoths and huge beavers and sloths and all kinds of creatures that are gone now. Sure. But evolutionarily speaking, these trees were around and had to deal with the grazing pressure and the physical impact of these large mammals. And of course, bison mm -hmm. and elk and the deer that are still you know, in the woods today um, in, the, in much of Minnesota. And so, you know, the trees in the forests 
you know, have learned to deal with herbivory and animal impact as much as grasslands have. Mm -hmm. And so from there, I just started slowly clearing some areas and letting more light in and uh, just seeing what happened. I was, it was really experimental and just mm -hmm. kind of deciding that I'm going to take this like 20 acre piece and just kind of let it be a guinea pig for really kind of converting, you know, from my own experience of, of converting wooded pasture, wooded areas into a silvo pasture. Yeah. So, so the, you, you said there that it was, you know, good that we didn't let cattle into woodlands there because the management wasn't there. And I think it might've been in the last podcast where you mentioned the tools have changed too, the, the technology that we have available has changed in our ability to manage these woodlands. What does that look like that's allowed us to change, you know, to be able to better manage these, these environments? Yeah, the two, primary, the two primary tools that have changed is water delivery systems and fencing. And so with, with you know, the advent and really I would say it's, it's not quite the dominance, but I, I see plenty of barbed wire around yet, but, you know, high tensile electric fencing and then the utility of temporary electric fencing technology, these you know, if you drive around and you see these bits of tape and, and, and twine, you know, subdividing a pasture, that's, those are, those are newer, you know, technologies that allow us to carry electric, you know, current out and allow us to, to really target grazing impact on a smaller area mm -hmm. cost effectively and with very little amount of time to be able to set up a, a move. And so that combined with, um, you know, particularly above ground, you know, water piping systems or, you know, shallow berry piping systems. We can deliver water um, anywhere pretty cost effectively now. And, and that allows for lower labor investment in being able to give water to livestock um, in appropriate areas mm -hmm. and um, be able to move those, move those watering sources frequently, which reduces the, um, congregation around those watering sites and allows us to spread out that impact, lessen right. that impact, and, and also keep the animals from having to walk so far to get to water. So yeah, it's better for the livestock to have water close. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So let's say, you know, somebody's, you know, interested, they want to do this. They think silver pasture, the benefits of it, the shade aspect, getting this different landscape and the wildlife and, and habitat on their farm is, is awesome. They want to do it. Um, I guess I see, and I'm not sure, you know, you can correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, but I see two major ways people are, are getting into silver pasture. And one is either is, is thinning in existing woodlands, or the other would be establishing trees into an otherwise cleared land. Um, let's start with thinning in existing woodlands. What are the different options that, you know, a farmer can utilize to thin those woodlands to actually create this, this uh, habitat in this uh, environment? Yeah, so the first, you know, the first thing to do is to walk through your, your woods and, and select which trees you're going to want to keep. Or you can do the reverse and select all the trees you want to remove. But you need to pick which trees and you need to learn to identify which trees are going to be um, suitable for the silvopasture pasture system. And you want to get your, your, you want to get your tree spacing right. You know, that's a key component. Um, we're looking at you know, starting out maybe around 40 to 50 feet between trees, possibly thinning down even further um, as time goes on out to 60, 70, 80, 100 feet between trees in a silvo pasture, like in a wooded setting. Mm -hmm. And um, so you're going to want to pick trees that are going to be suitable to that new environment that you're creating. And, and also trees that um, potentially, you know, if you, if you have a choice, picking a tree that ha is of good form that is going to result in a, a more valuable saw log uh, based on its form, but also the different species are of different value. And, and local markets really dictate that and they're very, they're kind of highly variable, but yeah, generally you're going to look for a tree with a, a good straight trunk with not a lot of lower branches and, and one that's going to be of, of higher value than another. And so, you know, you can get some help from a forester to think through some of those things first um, when, when thinking about, you know, flagging your site for any sort of tree removal. And from there, most farmers are, you know, doing it on their own. Um, you know, we have equipment. You can get a lot of work done. It's, it's pretty slow, but you can get work done with a tractor or a skid steer and a loader or a, you know, a winch and, uh, you know, a couple chainsaws and a brush saw or something like that. And 
um, just chip away at it as you can. A good way to start if you're interested is to, if you have a pasture that's up against a wooded area, um, don't think you have to do the whole thing right away, but you could think about, okay, I'm going to do the first like 50 or 100 feet deep of this wooded edge. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to get silvo pasture right there so I can get the forage up. And then when you look at, you know, you've got your cattle nearby grazing on rotation in your open pasture, and then you see there's going to be a couple days of 90, 95 degrees, high humidity. Well, you've got silvo pasture right next door that you might be able to dump the cows in on the, mm -hmm. you know, push your fence back so they don't mm -hmm. have the whole thing. But treat just a bit along your edge and um, start there. It's easier to remove trees from the edge of the woods anyways. You don't need logging roads or anything like that. And so that's, that's a good way to start thinking about this and get your feet wet yeah. um, with, with sort of the, 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 the different things you're gonna have to do to, to treat the site, so to mm -hmm. speak. And then also get a sense for the benefits um, yeah. before you take on yeah, 40 acres true. at a time or something like yeah. that. Additionally, you can hire out a logger um, and depending on what your site looks like, um, you could get a quote and sometimes you can get that work done at cost or, you know, even make a little money if there's decent, well, certainly if there's decent timber there, though many of our wooded areas are highly degraded and don't have a lot of good quality timber in them. But, um, you know, also it really depends on what your local markets are, how far sure. you need to go. But, um, yeah, it's worth looking into, uh, hiring a, uh, a, a contractor or a logger. Yeah. to come out and do that work if the site can pay for it so sure so i've heard and i have no idea if there's any truth to this or not like goats are they valuable in this kind of a thing can they go in and clear out a lot of stuff for you so that you don't have to mess around with the skid loader and the chainsaw or is that not realistic definitely so goats are being used to great effect um, on clearing you know underbrush in particular mm -hmm. sure. smaller trees i suppose if you push them harder they could they could girdle and strip the bark on smaller trees, but um, like in particular, they're being used to control buckthorn. And um, you know what is typically a very expensive um, brush clearing activity with equipment, very labor intensive, and has a lot of cleanup work. The bro the, the the goats can can um, yeah eradicate that buckthorn under the right management. Now most farmers don't have much experience with goats, and no. so. Um, mm -hmm. that's something to, you know, there's a curve there. Yeah. There's more of a curve to deciding I'm going to use goats tomorrow <laughs> than I'm going to hop in the skid steer with yeah. the forestry mulcher or whatever, yeah. or the brush saw and just chip away at it. So yes, yeah. with caveats, yes, goats sure. do great work. I know my, uh, my wife would love to have a few goats and I've always heard, you know, cattle, you can pretty well keep in sheep. If they find a way out, they'll go out, but goats search day in and day out for the way out of the fence and they make your life trouble. So I've yeah. heard they can be difficult and maybe that's just, I, I heard someone who had a bad experience, but yeah. that's, that's interesting. I think if you're, if you're good with, a, with temporary electric fencing materials and you've mm -hmm. been keeping in say hogs and sheep already, I wouldn't be afraid to try uh, learning to use goats. Just don't go buy sure. maybe 500 right away. Yeah. Like yeah. start with a few and sure. get your feet wet after a year or two. I think yeah. you'll be ready. Yep. Okay. Interesting. So like when I hear all this stuff, first of all, it sounds like a lot of work. Like it's, it's going to be a lot of work, might even have a lot of cost depending on how much you value your time. But you think a little more about that. You, if you've got this woodlands that otherwise is sitting idle and you say, you know, you would go buy pasture land or buy, you know, usable land for $4,000 an acre. Well, if you're going to put a 10 hours, 20 hours in an acre of, or something here and you value your time at 20 bucks an hour, you know, that's 800 bucks, a thousand bucks an acre, depending on what, you know, you have into this, you're gaining land that you otherwise would pay $4,000 an acre for or more, depending on your area and depending on the quality of land for a thousand bucks or less. And, so there's some pretty significant value to this if, if you've already got it paid for. Um, plus, you're not going to pay any more property taxes on that land, probably, because you've already owned it. So, I mean, there's some significant financial value. So even though it sounds like a lot of work, depending on how you value your time and what tools you need to get, it can be quite cost effective. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. And I would say also there, there are some potential pools of funding to help with that initial, mm -hmm. that initial setup cost. So... You know, there are obviously, there, there are different grants out there that you can seek mm -hmm. and cost share um, from different organizations. I'm not going to list them all, but I will mm -hmm. 
I will plug that the NRCS in Minnesota now has a silvo pasture standard. And so through EQIP, you can get funding for the various practices of establishing silvo pasture out of wooded area, as well as planting trees. But um, so you can get some cost share funding to do the TSI, the timber stand improvement, which is you know flagging those trees you want to keep and removing the rest, mm -hmm. as well as potentially brush control, I believe might be a separate one. And then there's like forage seeding and there's also fencing and water. You know, they have mm -hmm. fencing and water uh, okay. practices already, sure. you know, established for, um, you know, open pasture systems. So, and then, you know, it's going to come with the grazing plan and a management plan that comes with yeah. it. But um, so that's there and there's a potential, there's, so there's some financial help out there. Um, mm -hmm. And in some cases we're, we're, we are going to need it because there are places where the, there's, there's little value in what has to be removed and there's no market or not a market close enough to make it cost effective. And so you're going to end up, you know, paying a lot of money to hire someone to remove it, or you're going to have a lot of cost on your own end uh, in labor and, you know, equipment hours to yeah. uh, do that treatment. It's a, it's a real barrier, yeah. but um, it's, it's much less so of a barrier in some areas. And we do, like I said, we do have some, some newer uh, cost share opportunities to help out with that work. And I bet probably most of those are listed on your, uh, civil pasture resource manual on the SFA website. Too, Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Pick that up. It's, if you've got questions, there's probably an answer or someone in there who can help you find it. Sure. Yep. Okay. Okay, cool. So that is how we work on thinning existing woodlands. What about if somebody has like me, all my land around here is you know, pretty much cleared land and I love this idea of silver pasture. How would I even consider getting started and establishing an existing, I know you mentioned a little bit on your farm, how you did it. You know, what would you recommend? Yeah, I mean, there's really a number of components to thinking about, you know, when you're, when you're establishing silvopasture on cleared land, you're really starting from scratch. Mm -hmm. You get to pick, it's kind of a la carte, like you can pick whatever you want. Um, and, and you're going to want to, you're going to want to think about tree species, you know, and if, if you want, you know, some of the benefit of silvopasture also comes from winter shelter. Mm -hmm. If you don't have good winter shelter and you're trying to keep your livestock out on the land more like we are, in the livestock industry these days, um, keeping them out grazing, et cetera. Having shelter nearby is of enormous benefit in the winter as well. So conifers are a good thing to look for in that case, if that's something you think you're, that's one of the utilities that you're thinking of for silver pasture. Um, otherwise, you know, hardwoods, in my experience, they're tough to establish, but they tend to be higher value. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't, and so you, 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 should, you should probably be looking to um, an expert in your area, maybe at the SWCD or another forestry outfit or the University of Minnesota extension would be a good place to look um, to reach out to someone who can help you think through what are good tree species to think about planting for my area, my soil, climate, etc. And, and then pick something from there. Um, and then you're going to want to think, you know, tree spacing wise, I ultimately I'm looking at like around 50 feet between trees um, in, the long, in the long run. And so, and then you can plant them in different designs. I, I chose a, 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 a two row, a, a double row planting oriented north to south within an open pasture area in between. It made for easier management. I can put a fence around the two rows, mm -hmm. um, whatever, there's various reasons. It's also kind of a standard uh, for planting, sure. but you can, you know, you can do some kind of clumping plantings. Um, you can do single rows. You can do triple rows with faster growing trees on the outside and your center row of really high quality tree like a black walnut that is going to have a very, very high value veneer log and you want to train that log. So the outside rows grow faster and basically encourage the center row to grow tall and straight. Hmm. And that gives you a higher value log, more, you know, a long, a longer saw log that's, you know, clear and free of branching. Sure. So there's different, yeah, you, you can find out more information on that, but there's different planting designs to consider. And yep. then you want to lay out your fences and anything else that's going with the system so that, you know, leave yourself plenty of room to get livestock moved around within the system, mm -hmm. especially in the early years and also equipment. You know, if you're going to be in there, you might want to hay the alleys instead of, uh, graze them. And there's nothing magical about 
50 feet. It just was kind of a number. It's kind of in the middle. You know, you could do narrower and then sure. you'll end up thinning more trees later. Mm -hmm. You could do wider if, that, if that's better for your equipment. Try to make your, if you're going to do haymaking in your alleys, you know, during the establishment years, make it so that it's some multiple of your hay mower and wide enough that you can get around in there with your tractor. Sure. You know, make, make the system work for you so that you're likely to get the work done that you need to get done in there as much yeah. as possible. Mm -hmm. And then you have to just do standard tree planting, you know, practices. You got to control, you got to control weeds, do what you can to control uh, herbivory on the plants, you know, and that's both livestock and wildlife, you mm -hmm. know, and so planting trees is always a little bit of a gamble, but you can do plenty of things to at least try to set yourself up for success. And I would say one other thing is plant the biggest trees that you can, that you can feasibly get a hold of and, mm -hmm. and physically plant in a reasonable amount of time. The sure. bigger the tree, the bigger the root system, the more resilient it's going to be mm -hmm. the first few years. And it, the first few years is critical. Okay. And so, yeah, we planted the largest transplants that we could get from the state forest nursery in the pines. And um, yeah, they were real. We planted in 2012. It was a really, really dry year mm -hmm. and hot. And um, they did fine. We didn't water anything and they did great. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So one question, kind of last question just popped in my head here as I was thinking is like, is there any integration that livestock can have with fruit trees or some sort of different tree species that could produce additional revenue of some sort, as opposed to most of the trees you listed sound like their, their revenue source is 20, 30, 40 years down the road when they're harvested as timber. Yep, absolutely. So that's, yeah, so obviously, and, and, and that's of interest myself is integrating more profit, yeah, more profitable, you know, more crops, you know, stacking enterprises to an extent mm -hmm. on land mm -hmm. is always, you know, kind of something I'm looking at. But um, yeah. so in Missouri and sort of the South, you know, they have a lot of like pecan plantations and other nut crop plantations and fruit plantations. And there's been interest over the years to integrating, you know, livestock in the management of those systems. One, just so they don't have to mow. Mm -hmm. um that's one cost they can take off and they figure it benefits them there but mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it definitely can be done you need to be you know probably a, a lot of the fruit you know not so much with the pecans but a lot of you know up here if people are thinking about integrating livestock with say orchard crops uh apples in particular or something like that you you know you need to match the right livestock and mm -hmm. the right tree like i i would probably want to plant more like um uh, semi dwarf or even standard rootstock on apple trees so that they're much taller sure. and you get most of your canopy up and out of the way. Yeah. Um, and you know, otherwise, you know, integrating like sheep and chickens and things like that, you know, for the smaller scale kind of operation sure. is, is a much better option for integrating. Like, so the main street project, right. Integrates chickens yes. with hazelnuts. Yeah. And yeah. that's a pretty cool innovative practice. Yeah. So the, the one caveat, other than you need to match the livestock, the plants are a little bit more, you know, susceptible to damage and economic damage in a higher value system like that. But the one caveat is that there are restrictions on, you know, uh, you know, food uh, produce for human consumption and how, uh, how many days, there's like a, basically a restriction on the number of days from when that site can have had uh, animal products or animal byproducts like manure sure. applied to it. Okay. And so, different crops are going to be better suited mm -hmm. and probably the best way to think about it is to have i think after your crop is harvested mm -hmm. your your fruit or nut crop would be to think that's the best time to run to run livestock through the system sure because i think if you're grazing in your system up to a month or a few weeks before you're going to harvest your apples or your yeah. hazelnuts or something you know and i could be wrong but my understanding is that that is um against uh, like food safety practices. I think I've heard that as well. Yeah. And something, I guess, an additional benefit to grazing afterwards. I've heard of apple finished pork and different, you know, I mean, what's wasted and what's left is not wasted if it's consumed by, you know, another animal and stuff too. So. Yeah, I would say that, um, you know, probably a better benefit than really, I mean, apple finished pork, I don't know, I should probably try it. <laughs> yeah. I've heard about it, obviously, but. Um, sounds good. And acorn finished pork and all yeah. those other things. That sounds great. I would love to try something. <laughs> yeah. But um, <laughs> I think that, you know, the orchard's going to be a really high value crop mm -hmm. if, it's, if it's producing. 
Yeah. And so having the livestock be able to go through and clean up the drops, mm -hmm. that's, that's doing a huge service to like keeping uh, insect pressure and things down for subsequent years. And yes. so, you know, like good practice is hygiene in these, mm -hmm. you know, going mm -hmm. through and cleaning up all the uh, dropped fruits and things so that they're not harboring pests for next year. So the yeah. livestock can do that for you. And that could be, that could be very valuable, mm -hmm. but I also, yeah, pick the right livestock because if the livestock are damaging very high value fruit trees, yeah, I, I don't think I would do it. Like, sure. I don't think it would pay yeah. to do that. So you'd need to just, it's just a little bit more of a fragile combination. This yeah. Is, I guess what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Well, you know, it sounds complicated and complex, but I'm sure. Yeah. The advantage is once you figure out a management system that work well and you integrate these different species of livestock and, and plant species, I mean, nature had it figured out for a long time before we did. And I'm sure, I'm sure there's, you know, that's what we're trying to do, at least on our farm here is mimic nature in every way we can. So the better we can do that and, and start integrating, integrating livestock into some of these other landscapes, I guess the, that'll be, <laughs> it'll be great. It'll definitely. Be and there's definitely no harm in trying. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just seeing how it goes. Yeah. yeah. Well, that was the last question I had. And, you know, I know we mentioned it earlier, but a resource for anyone looking to do some of this would be, again, the Civil Pasture Manual on the SFA website, uh, the resource manual. But again, um, we have uh, a couple field days, uh, Civil Pasture Field Days coming up this summer in August. Do you want to run through those again, highlight those dates and locations? Okay, yeah, we've got three field days in the uh, first part of August, first half of August, uh, August 6th in Becker at Snake River Farm. August 11th in Brainerd at Sunup Ranch, August 13th in Wabasha at Tangled Bank Farm. Um, so we'll have uh, in the in the first part of the day, we'll have about 45 minutes or so of just sort of a classroom, quick download on silvo pasture to get everyone on the same page, and then we're going to go out into the field and do some uh, you know just kind of touring different areas of of these farms where uh, they've been implementing silvo pasture in the past few years and or just starting to do some silvo pasture work. Um, areas where they're looking at, uh, you know, converting in a wooded area into silvo pasture, areas really more specifically utilizing that practice to restore oak savanna, as well as potentially, I think, an area or two where, where we're, we're planting trees, you know, farmers planting trees out into an open area um, as well. And uh, we'll have some, some training some training documents to go with that and send home with people. We'll have an assessment tool, an initial site assessment tool to help people think through, you know, their goals um, for their system and what sort of first steps to, to, to um, have in mind for uh, setting up their silvo pasture, particularly for converting woodlands. Um, you can find more details and registration on these events at the Silvo Pasture and Agroforestry page on our website, www.sfa-mn.org. And we'll put the link in the show notes below. All right. Well, thanks, Tyler. Thanks for your, uh, yeah, your thoughts, your, your words of wisdom, and for sharing those uh, resources for us. Yeah, um, thanks, Jared. Yeah, thank you. Dirt Rich is produced by the Sustainable Farming Association. We believe that agriculture, done well, heals. For more resources or to tap into the Farmer to Farmer network, visit us at sfa-mn.org. Thank you.